And all my best for 2012. I'm so glad 2011 is behind us. I don't know about you, but it was just a tough, tough, tough year. A lot of wonderful things happened. Uh, and uh, But overall, I think, geez, everybody's kind of ready for, for a, a turn at the page. And uh, lots on the calendar here for the new year as the podcast moves to a new time and to a weekly format. I debated on whether or not I could handle a week at a time instead of bi-weekly, but a week at a time accomplishes a few things. Um, the new time slot especially makes it easier for me to be able to do the shows. It helps me to protect the weekends with my family, and and, and I found that a lot of people want to listen uh, in the evenings here in the States. For those who live overseas, it sucks <laughs> because I've gotten all the messages from people saying, what are you thinking? It's three in the morning here or wherever. But bear with me. I try to make sure that I get the uh, podcast on YouTube and and everything. Uh, the, the recorded shows up as soon as I can. The next thing it does is um, the weekly show makes it easier for new people to find us. They say, what time does the show air? And I can say it is on, you know, Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Central U.S. Uh, they can use a time zone converter. They're easily findable online and they can usually pretty quickly find out what time the show airs in their particular neck of the woods and they can find us and then they can just get used to, to realizing the show is going to be coming. Is it on this week? Is it on that week? They don't have to have that conversation. So uh, I'm still feeling it out, still working it out. And uh, we've got some great shows on the uh, roster already for January. Next Tuesday night is going to be about the clergy project, pastors who don't believe ministers, worship leaders, People employed by faith-based organizations who don't believe. And I'm not talking about the people who are cashing in. The, the charlatans, right? The snake oil sale, salesmen who just realized Jesus is profitable. These are people who started out in the ministry and then realized, wait a minute. And they started to go through their own path to apostasy. And yet they're still in a pastoral position. They're still a minister. So what do you do? Well, we talk with Dan Barker next Tuesday night, and we talk to many people. We read letters from many pastors and ex-pastors who are in that very situation. I'm a pastor, and I don't believe. I've been doing this for 25 years. I don't know how to do anything else. My entire financial future is at stake. What do I do? And uh, we'll connect people with the Clergy Project. We're going to talk after that on the 17th uh, about the National Atheist Party. It's a big election year here in the United States. Uh, can an atheist political party be viable? Uh, I'm dubious, and I, I said so. So I'm going to talk to the uh, big shots at the National Athe Atheist Party and find out. We'll, we'll get their perspective and challenge each other and have a discussion. Take your calls. Uh, also, later on, uh, we've got we're going to talk about I've got a great show I'm really looking forward to called Harry Potter is of the Devil. Now, those of you who aren't raised in a um, religious, devoutly religious culture may not may not have heard this, but it. it the religious are geniuses at finding evil everywhere. I mean, they don't see it as much where it actually is. They see it elsewhere. Uh, they project it onto otherwise benign things. Don't go to the Harry Potter movie. It's about witches. And witches are of the devil. I've had people say that they are afraid to play Dungeons and Dragons. D&D uh, &D will open up the the spiritual plane and allow the yeah, I don't know who knows what they're saying, but they just see evil everywhere they go. So we're going to we're going to talk about some of those examples, the people who project and see evil everywhere it is. Uh, I've got Aaron Ra going to join me in a future podcast. Uh, and then in February, we're going to talk about religion and sexuality and uh, coming out as a homosexual 
and coming out as an atheist honestly have very similarities because people will tell me those stories all the time. They'll say, look, you know, I was in the closet as a gay man or woman, and, and I, I went through this outing process and it was, you know, it was like giving birth. It was, you know, it was very painful. It was very liberating, but it was intense, you know. Oh, and then after that, I came out as an atheist and it was much the same. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how uh, religious cultures and the atheist culture, the atheist mindset approaches human sexuality, what science has to say about it. Anyway, uh, a lot of great shows lined up, and you can also uh, see those and lock into those on the podcast page on my website at thethinkingatheist.com. A very controversial topic today called Help, I'm a Closet Atheist. Let me start with a letter that I received. I'll just read it. It's a little bit long, but it's really, really good. And I think it sets the tone for us here. The letter says, when I saw the title of your upcoming show about closet atheists, I knew that I had to write to you and tell you my story because in the closet is the best way to describe my situation. I was actually raised in a non-Christian home. My father is what I would call apathetic agnostic. He doesn't know if there's a God and he doesn't really care. My mother had been to Episcopalian churches at some point in her past and would probably label herself a Christian, but she never gave any real indication of having any strongly held religious beliefs. I was never given any spiritual direction from my family while growing up. As teenagers are wont to do, I screwed up this practically ideal situation badly, although I wouldn't realize it until nearly 20 years later. When I was 14 years old, I fell in with a group of friends that were hardcore Christians. Now, at some point, I became born again. And when I went away to college, I started going to an Assemblies of God church in Savannah, Georgia. While there, I got involved in their St. Patrick's Day ministry, which involved at yelling at, I mean, preaching to and witnessing to people who really just wanted to drink beer and enjoy themselves. When things went badly one year, some of the people were spit upon or otherwise assaulted during the street ministry. I started to have doubts about what I believed and why, but I simply chalked this doubt up to the belief that this was a sign we were hitting Satan hard in a great spiritual battle, and this was just him fighting back. If I can digress from the letter for just a second... That so rings true with me. We would be in church services and they'd have sound or lighting problems with the media or something or the projector would go out. The pastor would always say, oh, Satan doesn't like it when you step on his toes. <laughs> Got to be the work of the devil. No, it wasn't that the life of your thousand hour bulb was out, was over with and you needed to replace it. No, it must be Beelzebub. Back to the letter. After college, I came back to my home state of New Jersey. I started going to another Assemblies of God church that seemed to be undergoing something of a revival, and this is where I met my wife, who's the daughter of the pastor of another Assemblies of God church and the sister of the pastor of yet another Assembly of God church. At the time we got married, I was still a devout believer, and I thought I would remain so until I died. After we were married, we wound up going to my father-in-law's Assemblies of God Church. Somewhere along the way, all that changed. The change didn't happen all at once. But this was a process that took several years. I began to realize that prayer never changed a situation in any way that couldn't be explained by random chance. I realized that I'd never heard the still, small voice of God myself. I realized that after years of hearing people give, quote, prophetic words, there was never any event or wisdom relayed in these messages, but they were always just random strings of encouragement that only sounded vaguely like language from the King James Bible. I realized that I'd never witnessed an actual miracle and that the people that claimed to be healed of cancer would later die of the very disease they were supposedly healed from. I began to realize that none of the people that were critical of the science that disproved young earth creationism understood a thing about it. I realized that none of the sermons I had heard for nearly two decades had changed any part of my life in a meaningful way, had encouraged me to be a better person, or had given me any comfort. 
I realized to my embarrassment that instead of spending so much time praying to a loving God, I'd just been talking to myself for over two decades. The letter continues. I can't think of one particular moment where it finally sank in that I no longer believed in the God of the Christian Bible. I know that I started to do web searches for phrases like leaving Christianity and began to investigate what people were saying about leaving their faith on the Internet. I finally started to see how I'd kept my mind within a Christian bubble of my own making for over half my life, and I'd managed to completely insulate myself from any kind of thought that was contradictory to my Christian beliefs. I finally saw that in my Christian beliefs I was no different from an Orthodox Jew or a fanatical Muslim or a dedicated Hindu. As I had just as much evidence for what I believed as they do, that is to say, none, so now I finally broken free of the mental bondage that is fundamentalist Christianity. This leaves just one little problem, which is that my wife and her entire family are either still Assemblies of God pastors or devout believers, and all of the close friends I've had my entire life are still serious Christians. My entire time of questioning my faith happened in my own head. For I would never dare to ask any question critical of Christianity within earshot of my wife or her family. My entire worldview is completely changed, and no one outside of my own mind has any idea that it's happened. I spend time on forums populated by former Pentecostals and former believers, but no one in the real world knows that I'm no longer in the ranks of believers. I dare not come out of the atheist closet for fear of how my wife will react. The very few exploratory comments that I've made in front of her to see her reaction have been unmitigated disasters. If I suddenly came out that I not only don't believe in what the Assemblies of God espouse, but that I don't believe any other part of Christianity anymore, I can't see how it would end any other way than badly. I can't see how my marriage wouldn't end in divorce, or worse, in a cold, loveless marriage in which I am regarded by my wife as a broken person that ruined our relationship. So now I just go through the motions. We pray over our dinner and with our two children. We get up on Sunday morning and go to my father-in-law's church. I try to avoid any conversation with people that involves religion in any way, but with my in-laws and the people who attend my father-in-law's church, this doesn't leave much to chat about, so I simply spend a lot of time at social gatherings and my own silent thoughts. I still love my wife and my kids dearly, and I don't want to destroy everything that is good in my life. I don't know how to tell my wife that in my own head I've already left the faith. I feel like I'm living a lie, but can't help but think that telling the truth could only make things even worse. I wish I could actually call into the internet radio show to tell my story, but I know I wouldn't be able to do so without my wife asking questions or finding out the truth, so I had to write this email instead until I somehow find the courage to be myself and be open about my beliefs, I must remain a closet atheist. If you use my story on the show, please don't use my real name. Refer to me instead as Trapped Pentecostal. I uh, spoke about the challenges of the closet atheist and coming out to those around you having gone through it myself. And I sympathize and empathize greatly with those who do it very slowly and methodically. I always say it's, uh, you know, it, blurting out exactly what is on your mind may feel good, <laughs> but is it really the best idea? And on the Facebook page, I said to our users, for those about to charge those still in the closet with cowardice, or lack of conviction, I remind you that public apostasy is often a game of chess, not checkers. When you're paying bills, feeding mouths, and working through the gauntlet of a religious culture, it's a lot more difficult than most people realize. Once I said those words, the floodgates opened, and a very polarized response came in. Some people said, yes, it is difficult. I've been through it myself, or I know someone who has. 
And, you know, you've got to take your time and you have to think about, you know, personal and professional consequences. And other people said that's just BS. It's a cop out. Jason said, closet atheist, you have to be kidding. It's a simple case of right and wrong. Truth versus lies. Grow a spine. Closet atheists. JC wrote, to me, these spineless, and yes, I call them spineless and soft atheists, not only hold us back, but cause us harm. It's precisely because so many people are pussies about it that atheism is so outwardly niche. Edmund Burke has said that all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing, and I believe that point holds true here. Now, I don't necessarily mean that one should be outspoken at work or at family gatherings, but then again, I believe that achieving a better world will only come by destroying the old structure. There are plenty of social situations that are low risk, like a person breaking an addiction. You have to make hard choices. If you have a long-standing friendship with somebody who is spiritually coercive, tries to get you to go to church, prays with you all the time, etc., I would suggest you weigh the benefits of distancing yourself from this person and telling them why against continuing to submit to the religious majority out of fear of rejection. I've done it, and yes, it is hard, but honestly, I've made new friends who share my beliefs and others who at least respect them. So maybe don't be overt about it, but don't just climb into the closet and bar the door. Cowering in fear all your life makes you a coward and a fool. Catherine wrote, I wonder if the Grow a Spine crowd would be so willing to be bold about their atheism if dropped in Iran, Yemen, Pakistan, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Nigeria. Unless you have a death wish, it wouldn't be advisable. I wonder how many in the Grow a Spine crowd have been a street kid with nowhere to go. I agree that when it's possible, there's no imminent physical danger and there's no threat of being beaten, tortured, homeless, murdered, or lose everything important to you, your job, your home, your family, that you should be honest about who you are and admit you're an atheist. I'm fortunate to live in a country where it's safe to be who I am and admit my lack of belief without the threat of violence or losing everything. Not everyone is as fortunate. It's a very sticky, complicated topic, and a lot of people want to sound off. Let's go to the phones and talk to Brandon. Brandon, thank you so much for holding. You are on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's up? Hey, sir. Thanks so much for having me. It's just um, a situation like this, to be honest. I haven't suffered a long period of time of being in the closet since this is really over the past couple of months that this has happened. So it's, it's hard for me to say that I've been through a whole lot. I'm trying to hide anything. I'm actually at the point where I'm just trying to figure out how to do this over a, a period of time. The problem is it's it, 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 it's hard to know what to say or, or how to space it out or how to do it in a slow manner just because uh, it, I'm afraid of what I'm going to find out basically from the family and just from friends and everything. I think uh, the, the friends that I have will most of the time will probably be more understanding. I think ultimately the parents would too, but... As with anybody, you don't want that. You don't want to have to deal with that initial reaction. But I mean, like like one of the letters you read, I, I understand where the principle of where the guy's coming from, saying, you know, it's kind of gutless to just kind of stay in the closet for so long. But I mean, it's I mean, there's more to it than that. It's it's not as simple as just saying, all right, well, I'm just going to do this and be defined. I mean, there's relationships and everything attached, as many people know. So you know, it's kind of hard to know where to start. But I'm actually in. Uh, just started reading Godless, and a couple of chapters in, what kind of started worrying me was actually seeing some of the reactions that, that Dan got from some people, and, and, you know, not that I've experienced any of that yet because nobody really knows, but I, I have to admit that I'm kind of worried that I'm going to get some of that, even though I wasn't on any kind of a scale like he was. I mean, he was in the, he was known and, and was, was in the church and was active and everything. I'm nothing like that. I'm For those who are wondering what... What Godless is, it's a book by Dan Barker. And Dan Barker was a former evangelist that we're going to speak to next week. So I wanted to clear that up for anybody who maybe didn't make that connection. Or do you come from a seriously divi religious family or, uh, I mean. When I was, when I was growing up, my family was, was marginally Christian, but over the past uh, 10 years or so, they've, they've all gotten very involved and they're all Southern Baptist. And, uh, and around 2004, I started getting into, 
are starting to list or started listening to philosophical Christian philosophical lectures. I'm kind of see that as a contradiction in terms, Christian philosophy or whatever, but started listening to R.C. Sproul, Greg Bonson, and everything like that, and kind of got into it because of that, but I was actually more into the philosophical part of it than I was actually the Christian part of it, but I still, you know, got baptized in 06, and I'm still not sure if the family was even happy with me getting in a, a different denomination than they were, but it, I guess the ironic part of it is, is listening to all those debates and, and all of that, I was always rooting for my guy, and I mean, uh, Bonson, for instance, was a talented debater, but I mean, once, once the other side it actually started just saying things, and I would have what you said in your Oklahoma speech, I'd have the God glasses on, would have to kind of push that stuff to the side and want my guy to win. And I'd always be listening to what he said, but then eventually what everybody else was saying kind of just started sinking in, and it just... The worst part about that is it doesn't matter how good of a debater you are, how much education and how philosophical you think you are, but the problem with arguing as a Christian philosopher is that you can't stand up to the basics. I mean, you can't get past the Bible parts of it, the contradictions. You have to be able to get past those basics, and those guys never can. There's always something that they miss. And that's eventually what kind of led me to this, is just none of the questions were ever fully answered. They were only in parts, and... And that's kind of it's kind of where it ended up. And well, let me let me move out of the apologetics of it very quickly, and 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 the arguments that help change your mind. But as far as you and your culture, your friends are believers. Your family, your coworkers, are you are you afraid to come out, or do you worry that there will be consequences? As far as the family, consequence wise, honestly, that my biggest fear is asking the question, well. Do you think I'm damned? And I and I, I'm just envisioning that moment and and hoping. Part of me almost never doesn't want to say anything for a while because I mean there's grandparents involved and you know they're they're getting getting up there in age and why should I even try this late to have anything said? But and yeah, I can deal with doing grace over dinner before you know during the holidays or something like that. I can deal with that, but at the same time, it still feels ridiculous when. I have them saying things about a situation being a God thing or something. When something good happens, it's always because of that. I feel like I'm not doing anything. But consequence-wise, it's just wondering if they think I'll be going to hell, which I'm not sure they'd be able to look me straight in the face and say. Uh, at work, I'm, I'm not sure I really fear that consequence. Friend-wise, uh, most of my friends, I think, are believers, but only in the marginal sense. Not, uh, some of my friends do go to church on a regular basis, but most don't and just say, they're spiritual and they believe, but they don't think they have to go to church. So consequence-wise, it, it primarily has to do with the immediate family more than anything. And, you know, which worries me, and it kind of makes me wonder if I should even do it anytime soon or just kind of let it be gradual. It certainly wouldn't be abrupt. So, like I Is said, I, I'm, I'm not going through some of the harsh situations that I know a lot of closet atheists have been going through probably for months, if not years. But, you know, I, I can only imagine what that's like for some, some of them. Well, I appreciate your call very much, and, and whatever the, wherever the road takes you, I, I wish you the very best and know that you have literally thousands of people who have your back here. And so you are not alone, Brandon. <laughs> Happy New Year, brother. We'll see you later. Area code 256. Hi, you are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What is your name? Hi, um, my name is Jack. What do you have for us today? Do you have an opinion on the subject? Yeah, um, I'm a I'm a foreign exchange student from South Korea. You know, it's been it's been like very different culture since I came here from very different culture. You know, and I've experienced like very like very hardcore Christianity in here in Colorado. Yeah, that's the state where where I'm living right now. And I'm an atheist, but I've been not talking to my host families or my friends or my teachers because, well, I'm, well, kind of ironic because I'm going to, um, like, Christian school right now. So I've been close to atheist, too. Well, I mean, my family, my natural family is not Christian, but, I mean, still, it's, I'm spending almost a whole year in USA, and... <laughs> This seems quite like a very hard thing for me right now. Well, thanks for the input, and I wish you the very best. I appreciate you listening to the show today. Take care of yourself. Okay, thank you. 
I've got a Skype call. A, uh, the name is Jack Rabbit Forever. <laughs> uh, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Hey, Seth. Glad you're calling in. What's up? Uh, well, I'm uh, an ex-Muslim uh, here in Egypt, and uh, I'm having trouble coming out to my family because of if my family is religious, and if they were to know, I might get disowned. Or maybe even worse, I don't think they have it in them, but they might move to say, we don't want to a non-believer in college. You know what I'm saying? Now, for those who are wondering what the why we're hearing a little bit of an echo on your voice, you have actually altered your voice for this call because you want to disguise your natural speaking voice in case this gets around to someone that you know. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I think we can understand you, but you're disguising your voice. Why? What are you? What are you worried about? What do you fear? Well, my family are very, you know, sophisticated internet users, and I wouldn't find it surprising if they stumbled upon one of these videos. So it's just a precaution for me. Uh, yeah. But uh, here's the thing about Islam: it's just this really, really, you know, it twists the minds of people who believe in it. Uh, so that they think I actually have a very close personal friend he's practically my brother and he actually believes that uh, a guy like Hitler did something good it's extremely anti-Semitic although he might not act on it just a person saying that just makes you really really sick do you ever wish that you could pack your bags and move to a part of the world where you can just blurt it out loud at the top of your voice? Oh, yeah. That's one of my dreams. I actually really want to come over to the uh, U.S., but you know how it is. My friend, if you ever make it over here to the to the, uh, to the the 50 states, I promise, the drinks are on us, okay? And I appreciate your bravery in speaking out. Please know that even though you cannot speak your mind for whatever reasons you have in your local culture, that you are not alone, that people are rejecting superstition and embracing science, reason, and common sense all around the world, and they stand with you, okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've also, you know, found uh, a lot of great, uh, great help on your forum, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great way to connect people. So you have found the forum at thethinkingatheist.com. A lot of people use the Facebook page. They aren't aware that we actually have a forum, and James has done a great job with with moderating and putting that together. But the forum has really blossomed. It has helped you then to connect with people? Oh, yeah. that's uh, It's been a great help. I've been on it almost every day, just discussing with people and just getting it out, off of my chest, even though I don't know these people people personally and glad you called also, today uh, if you don't mind i'd like to give out a shout out to my youtube channel it's called jackrabbit forever i'm currently making videos about how islam is so irrational and wrong it's like, like a view of islam from an insider Jack Rabbit, the number four ever. Jack Rabbit forever on YouTube. I'm guessing your face and real name are not on that channel. <laughs> they aren't. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, happy New Year and uh, all my best to you. Thank you for uh, calling the show. Thanks for taking my call. Take care. Hope everybody was able to understand him. I, I had a couple of guys mention that a, a pitch tune might have been a little easier uh, to understand, but I totally get why he disguised his voice. And I had a call last, was it last year? from um uh he was he was i don't remember what part of the world he was in but he was deathly afraid of the muslim brotherhood uh which he feared much more than even the taliban and uh i mean those guys will jack you up and he uh he was very isolated and felt very much alone and uh was hungry to connect with other free thinkers and I, you know, I'm spoiled rotten here in the Midwest of the United States. I mean, sometimes I, I get all pity party and think, ah, oh, geez, this sucks. I got it really bad. No, I'm, I don't. I live, uh, I live in a, a, a country where you can put up the thinkingatheist.com and I'm constitutionally protected to do so. Try that in Iran. Try that in other parts of the world. Try that under the uh, umbrella of the Muslim Brotherhood. I think not. It's very, very difficult for so many out there. One more before we read some more email. Let's talk to Drew, who's been on hold for about 30 minutes. Drew, thanks for your patience, and welcome to the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's up? Hey, Seth. Um, this is really, uh, you know, interesting for me because I just recently became an atheist. And 
And um, I, I went to a uh, very uh, famous liberal arts college. I, live, I actually live out in Naperville, which is a suburb of Chicago. And I basically, I, I credit my college education with just sort of stripping away my lack of faith because my parents are not devoutly religious. I was raised Lutheran, and there are many things that I like about, you know, the Lutheran faith. But, uh, you know, I got confirmed and baptized and all that. But uh, my my parents were just of the belief that, you know, you had to have some kind of, you know, religious background to be a moral person. So, yeah, basically, I just started reading atheist material, and I'm, I'm thinking, my God, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Were you a little bit afraid? I mean, uh, one, the pieces come together, right? And you start realizing that you're finally becoming comfortable in your own skin. But on some level, that's a little scary for a lot of people. It certainly was for me. What was going on in your mind? You know, I, I guess I, I have it pretty easy because, you know, my family isn't religious. But for some reason, I'm just I'm having trouble because it's like, OK, do I really want to tell people that I just chucked all my my belief system out the window. I mean, you know, my, my friends know that I'm not particularly religious and there's this phenomenon that I've noticed that it's that it's acceptable to say that you're not religious, but if you say that you're an atheist and you have no belief in God whatsoever, they're like, Whoa, hold it. It's hard for me for some reason. I just I just can't do it yet. Well, I, I would encourage you to do it on your timing and not somebody else's. And I have a lot of people who will, you know, there a lot of people will try to push you out that particular door. But once that 900 pound gorilla is out of the cage, it it's never going back. <laughs> you will never get that back. You know, and it's like my liberal arts education, you know, liberal arts education is like they teach you to question everything. And I, I love looking at things logically. I just I love things that make sense. And I just realized religion does not make any sense. I will tell you, when the time comes for you to just shout it out wherever, whenever, however that happens, it, it, it's going to be scary and there will be consequences. But I will say that there are a few feelings in this world as liberating as finally just saying to hell with it. It took me a, a series of several years and I'll get into that here in a little bit but I mean there when the when the time comes and you just you know you you, you put on the t-shirt and you walk outside and you say all right atheist <laughs> right here <laughs> you know it it, it and it, on one level is one of the best most liberating feelings I personally have ever felt and I wish the same for you whenever that day comes okay Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm gaining you know a lot of confidence just you know talking to you. I mean, I I lost my uh, grandmother and I've, I've stopped invoking God. I didn't say I'll see you in heaven. I just said farewell, goodbye. You know, because I know that I'll have memories with her and I know she's gone and she's just not coming back. Because I look at the world so differently now, it's like, you know what? I'm just going to think about how much she meant to me and just remember her and love her for the person that she was. And it's just been so, it's a great feeling. I get it, Drew. Thanks for the call. And I appreciate you being a part of the show today very, very much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, take care. I'm a, I'm not a big like city activist, local politics guy. Um, you know, I've got a full-time job, full-time life. The thinking atheist activities keep me very, 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 very busy. I, I, I feel like I'm juggling chainsaws all the time. But recently, um, I ended up being involved in a city council meeting. Uh, they were going to build, uh, I just bought a home four months ago. And uh, forgive the cliche, but on some levels, it's kind of my dream home. It's, it's, it's something that is very dear to Natalie and me. It's just... You know, we we looked at a lot of places. We we agonized over it. We found exactly what we wanted, and we 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 bought our home and decorated it together and made it made it exactly what we wanted and hoped it would be. Right? And those of you who've bought a home kind of know what that's like. So anyway, we're here, and and they uh, 
announced that they were going to do some crazy development right just down the street. And uh, the, uh, that's not really what we want. Now, I end up at a city council meeting, right? Because they're discussing whether or not this is going to be approved. And so for, I, I'm at one of the first city council meetings I think I've ever been at. A lot of citizens are all sitting there. And at the beginning of the meeting, they stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic in which it stands, one nation. The next words are under God. And I stopped speaking. The words under God, by the way, were not in the original Pledge of Allegiance. They were added much, much later. And then I continued with the rest of it. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I finished the Pledge of Allegiance and Natalie was sitting next to me and I couldn't help but see her smile. And all of a sudden it hit me. I thought, wait a minute. I, I, there's a church here across the street. There's a church on every half block. I'm in the buckle of the buckle of the Bible belt. And I am a part of something that my community is doing, right? My neighbors and I have come together to try to effect some positive change. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many of these committees I would be either not invited to or rejected from if this under God crowd all around me realized that Every week on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock Central USA time, I host the Thinking Atheist radio podcast <laughs> and produce videos and have a website that essentially says the Bible is total crap. How many of those people would return my calls? How involved would I have been able to be in my own community? Discrimination happens in subtle, subtle ways. You know, it's very rare that somebody comes out against a person of color. I mean, it happens. But I'm in the workplace, if discrimination happens, don't you agree that, it, at least here in America, it happens subtly so often. You don't get called back for the next interview. You don't get advanced for the position, whether it's race or gender or religion or whatever. They just happen to lose your name in the stack of potential candidates. You aren't part of the very small list of appointees or nominees. They, they just, you just weren't part of the selection process. No, no, it wasn't because of their religion. No, it wasn't because he was an atheist. It wasn't because he was black or whatever. It wasn't because he was homosexuality. It wasn't, wasn't because of it. Either. No, no, he just, they just weren't qualified like this other person is. That's how discrimination works. Now, I realized that you don't just put somebody in that position because of their color or their uh, sexual orientation. I don't believe in that either. But what I'm saying is when discrimination happens, it happens in subtle and almost always in unprovable ways. So think about me, right? I'm in a job that serves quite often churches and my, the company I work for still serves churches and faith-based organizations from time to time. Years ago, I was heavily wired in. I was on the road, traveling to churches, sometimes three or four a month, doing church conferences sometimes. This is in 2005, 6, and 7. Now, this is around the time that I'm starting to really come to a po point of critical mass, right? right? But I'm in my job. I'm, I'm in my career. I'm really in conflict. But this is my job. This is what I do. This is how I pay the rent, the mortgage. This is how I pay my bills. This is how, I, this is how we survive. And then I get to the point where I just don't believe it anymore, right? And you've heard this over and over. You see the pattern. People say, I just got to the point where I couldn't believe it any more. But in my job, I serve clients. Some of my clients are churches. 
It is my duty to serve them, the client, with excellence. And I did, by the way. It is my duty to represent my company. Sometimes to churches. I tore myself apart. It's, it's the reason that when the Thinking Atheist began as a website, that I was so far in the background because I was bursting out. I had to connect. I had to talk. I had to, I had to, to somehow uh, let it out personally while I extricated myself from this web. And it took a couple of years Now, some people would have said, screw it, man. You don't know anybody anything, you coward. What's the matter with you? You're not a true atheist. You're not really, you don't have any conviction. If you had conviction, you'd throw caution to the wind. You'd walk out into the street and just tell everybody, family, friends, coworkers, associates, clients, screw them. If they don't get it, they don't get it. It's on them. Why should you have to bend over for the religious? But for me, it wasn't that simple. I mean, let's say that some of our clientele realized that I was a non-believer. They withdraw their business, right? Legal, illegal, whatever. That for some reason, whoever it is, is a person of faith, and they, on a moral position platform, withdraw. They just pull their money. They didn't just punish me. They punished every single employee of that business and the ownership. They affect their lives, their incomes, their livelihoods. The profitability, the viability of the entire company is affected. I am not an island unto myself. What happens if, for some reason, I become a liability to the company? I don't know. I, I was in virgin territory. I had no idea what to expect. I'm very fortunate that they've stood by me, by the way. Very fortunate. The ownership has, has stood by me, no matter how difficult it has been. And it has been difficult. They are true believers. They've stuck by me. They believe, and, and I so appreciate this, that people died to give them the freedom to be able to practice their religion. And that same freedom affords me the ability to reject religion. And they stand by me. But I'll tell you, when that mortgage payment comes around, ideology sounds wonderful, but it does not feed our, our mouths. It does not pay the bills. And I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not going to live under a bridge somewhere. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sacrifice every, everything. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to find a way out, but it may not be all at once. For me, it took a few years. It's a game of chess, not checkers. At least it was for me. Many disagree. Ron wrote on the Facebook wall and said, We do not have time to move forward at the pace you deem necessary. When religious fundamentalists threaten our rights and probably the future of mankind, with those steeped in religious fundamentalism who threaten our existence with nuclear weapons... Please, will all intellectual, idealist, atheists lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way? All caps. We need change now, not after abortion and reproductive rights have been stripped away or stem cell research stopped or nuclear bombs are raining down on us. The whole I am atheist, an atheist intellectual idealist who knows best how to change minds crowd not only gets under my skin, but has done very little to change religious minds as they sit on their asses waiting for the religious to come to them or visit their websites or call their radio TV shows. Brave men change the world and minds of those who often have to be brought kicking and screaming into the 21st century. I do not understand why anyone thinks that a revolution of the mind will be any different than one fought on a battlefield. They are both dirty and nasty affairs. And sometimes you have to get dirty in a nonviolent way to get things done. Thanks, Ron, for the message. Amanda said, I'm happy that so many people live in such a privileged life that they cannot possibly understand the consequences that being an out atheist can be to certain people. As a lifelong atheist, I'm an out atheist, but my grandparents who raised me 
They didn't want to be. My coming out at 18 accidentally outed them. You cannot possibly imagine the outright torture my grandmother endured from the local church folk. My grandmother was dying of multiple, how do you say it? Is it my, myeloma? M-Y-E-L-O-M-A. Forgive me, Amanda. That had spread to her brain, causing her to have the mental capacity of a five-year-old. So hearing the graphic descriptions about how her flesh was going to melt and burn in the fires of hell, it makes me sick to think of how terrified her last month on this earth was because of the harassment from these evil people, and yet, had I simply waited, I could have prevented her suffering. My coming out when I chose to was selfish, and I will regret it for the rest of my life. Nobody was oppressing me as a closeted atheist. Nobody was forcing their religion on me. Yet the moment I opened my damn mouth, the whole world changed. I lost friends. I lost jobs. I became ostracized from a community that once loved me. I became their project rather than a person. I was homeless, unemployed, and sick for a period of no less than three years. I live a good life now as an open atheist, but those years still haunt me. My husband was a closeted atheist until right before our wedding. I was determined not to make the same mistake of accidentally outing him to his mother and stepfather, who are Catholic. It wasn't my place to do so. I urged him to talk to them, but he was afraid of the repercussions he eventually had to tell them. When they realized we weren't having some big church wedding, it wasn't pretty, to say the least. So to all you privileged people who cannot possibly understand and obviously don't care about the suffering that can come with being an out atheist, let me say this, but out, live your own life and keep your nose out of other people's business. Amanda, thank you very much for the letter. Area code 253. Thank you so much for your patience on hold. You are now on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Sam. What's going on? Well, I'd just like to share my opinion concerning when you said checkers, the difference between playing checkers and chess. I agree with you 100%. See, we as atheists, uh, when atheism becomes a religion, this is when you start to ranting and raving, much like the Christians do. See, a real atheist perceives most individuals who are under the spell or under the hypnosis of religion to be psychologically unstable or, in a sense, insane. So if you see someone sitting over there in the corner saying, I'm Superman, I'm Superman, you're not going to go over there and argue with him whether he's Superman or not. So atheists who are arguing arguing with Christians and you already know are, are religious folk who are pretty much in control of the world right now. Atheism is one of the smallest growing but fastest growing groups because we're starting to see the BS. But to argue, just like you say, and put everything in jeopardy, no, I think being a quote-unquote closet atheist is actually an advantage because you can manipulate. Uh, it's pretty much, <laughs> excuse the term, the devil's playground. And you can use this to your advantage to get wealth, prosperity, and power. You do not have to be religious about it. And I think that's, I just want to share that when, when atheists get to the point where they're arguing and, and no, we got to go out there and we got to stop this and bombs are going to blow up. Pretty much atheism have became a religion for them. Let me see if I get you. I mean, I honestly believe that if no one ever says anything, then no one says anything. We, we do have to go out and engage the culture. Uh, I think we do have to go out and debunk because as Michael Shermer says, there's a lot of bunk out there. I think you have to choose those battles. Sometimes you're just talking to yourself. When the religious put on the mannequin smile, you realize that no conversation is taking place. I understand that. But what you're saying is what? You, you, you go into stealth mode, play by the religious rules, and then in a clandestine way? Create corruption. I mean, to, the point of, to, the, to this point, you can de demolish Christianity, demolish Islam, just like the guy with the videos, you can demolish the, the idiocy of it, as you can see the fabric of religion is falling apart right now today, mainly because of the individuals who had their pot, their hand in the deep parts of the pockets of religion, like ministers who are step, stepping off the podiums, imams who are stepping off the podiums. These are the people that are really destroying religion right now. So it, it, it just shows that if you do it covertly because just 
just like someone who is insane, you can't talk logic to them. You have to talk indirectly to their subconscious mind to get something accomplished. So well, what, what I'm are you just telling saying do? do it, but do it covertly. Are you telling me that I, I or someone like me should go and get a minister position and effect change from inside the church? No, but I am telling you that you should teach a couple of ministers, by all means, you should have a couple of ministers in Islam, in Christianity, and other religions teaching under you covertly and indirectly teaching individuals the truth. Because, believe it or not, when a person get on the podium and they put on that collar, they can tell you anything and people will believe it. That's how religion pretty much works. So you should have a crew of individuals. If you really want to destroy religion, you must do it covertly because religion works in subconscious covert measures. That's how they get people to blow themselves up. They've mentally covertly suggested it to them. So you can do the same thing to undo that idiocy. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective, man. Thanks for the call. Thanks for waiting so long, too. I appreciate it very much. Why approach an honest subject dishonestly? We are pursuing truth. We should probably speak about it truthfully. And I'm not convinced that we should play by the rules of any religion to do so. We need to be acting to make sure that our families are protected and whatnot as we come out. But in presenting our message, I don't know that I agree. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be curious. I'm sure we're going to hear about this one on the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's a sticky one. Area code 503. You are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Camille. Glad you're calling, Camille. What's up? I'm a full-time nanny. And, you know, I have to tell you, the first thing that I say is we don't do a lot of religion around here. <laughs> and when I'm interviewing new families. Well, wait a minute. Now, so uh, if you're a nanny, then what a... What a uh, a parent expect you to what say bedtime prayers with their kids or mealtime prayers is that the kind of thing you're trying to nip in the bud or what right away it's like the first thing we say we don't do santa we don't do jesus we don't do religion around here and what kind of reaction do you get it varied even for my christian clients we get some pretty <clears throat> varied reactions i often say right after that we teach tolerance but we also teach no mythology. And uh, it is it, quite very. Some people just stare at me blankly. <laughs> and I've had people just get up and walk out. Just get up, grab the kids, and leave. When I started to stay home with my son and to take on other people's children, it was a really difficult decision to say, I'm just going to approach it this way. Did you come from any kind of religion, or were you always a non-believer? Both. Always a non-believer from a very religious background. They didn't force it on you as a child, then? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that I just can remember very clearly, very early, thinking uh, to myself, this is uh, really unusual. This is strange. I mean, I went to the church where people spoke in tongues, and it was very fun. To dance and sing and have a good time. I'm a real dancey, singing kind of person. But I can remember thinking, you know, these people are going to know really quickly that I'm not buying it. Do, uh, uh, and I tried to go along with it until I was about fifth grade, and then I just said, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going anymore. And your parents didn't freak out? Oh, yeah, they did. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they did. And it wasn't easy. My teenage years were really difficult. And then I just sort of went underground, and it was about in my late 20s that I just quit apologizing, and I just came out as who I was. So that's actually why I'm calling, is to sort of lend my voice to the support to those who are possibly coming out, thinking about coming out, having a hard time with the concept. I mean, you'll lose friends. I want to just say that right away. You'll probably lose some friends. You'll probably have to bite your tongue a lot if you want to be politically correct. But on the other hand, you should know that there are secular meetup groups where you can meet other people, go to Craigslist, look for other people that are talking on the, the uh, what do they call them, their bulletin boards, 
And the more you talk about it, the more you'll find that grandparents, parents, teachers, there's lots of other people out there like you, and there's a whole social network of those of us who are atheists. There just is. And you may find yourself alone for a little while, but, you know, that anxiety that you live with every single day when you're just pretending, it starts to fade. And you start to feel some integrity about the way you live. And it is absolutely worth living truthfully. There was no feeling for me like just coming out and saying, oh, geez, I don't have to do the tap dance anymore. I get to live in my own skin. Yes, it's difficult, but it was so liberating. Even now, when I catch hell from, you know, family, friends, whatever, if they give me that condescending look or they pray extra loud at the meal <laughs> or I or I get some, you know, I, I got an email from a theist uh, uh, not long ago praying everything I touch will fail, praying God's curse upon me, whatever that is. You know, every despite all of those those things, I find myself really happy really happy. Has the same been true for you? Yeah, I feel like um, I've touched a chord when that happens. I actually recently lost a whole mommy's group that I used to go and see regularly. And uh, the main reason was because I called out a theist who was telling me all the time that I was missing something in my life. And I was feeling a little forked tongue. I was feeling a little snappy that day. And I just looked her straight in the face and said, I'm just not psychotic. I just, I can't do it, and I can't split my brain in half and pretend to do it. So if you're religious, that's fine. You can be that way. I refuse to teach my children mythology and fantasy or fear of an entity instead of moral dignity. And I haven't heard from those ladies since. (laughs) (laughs) Have a nice day. (laughs) I have a whole lot. Right, exactly. I pretty much packed up and knew I wasn't coming back. But, you know, I do. I have a whole new group of friends now that I met up through Meetup. And, of course, I live in a very liberal area. Uh, 503 is uh, Oregon. You know, we're a bunch of hippies out here. So, Real real fast, though. I mean, I've got to move on in just a second. But give me your perspective then. You live in a, I mean, you don't live in the buckle of the Bible belt like some of us do. But what's your perspective? If someone is taking their time or, or saying nothing outside of their little box, let's say they have not yet come out, are they cowards? Are, are they not committed, or is there something I'm missing? What's your perspective? You know, the way I look at it is I can, I can remember, like I said, I can remember clearly at about 10, thinking these people are going to know that I'm frauds, that they're, they're going to know that I don't believe this, and that I'm a fraud, and that I'm just pretending. And I can't be the only one that thought that. I can't be the only one that thinks that. The way I look at it is I don't judge those people. I happen to have the fortitude and the guts and some people just don't and I don't think that that is necessarily something that you should hold against people I think that it's something that it's just going to take a while (laughs) you know some people don't come out until the very end of their lives and some people some people can come out now I mean I don't I, I don't know how to, I don't know. Well, I think I think the, the road to um, out of religion is probably as unique as the individual itself. Um, I think you said it. Everybody's situation is unique. Their personal, interpersonal relationships, their career path, their financial obligations, the logistics of their lives are so unique to them that you cannot say everyone has to do it the same way. Uh so I appreciate your call. Thank you so much. And, you know, everybody send your everybody send your kids to her. You know, she'll she'll read them. She'll read them some Hitchens and get them on the path, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dear. Have a good night. Happy New Year. Take care. Let's talk to area code uh, 646. You've been on hold a while. Thanks so much for your patience. Who is this? This is Jay. Thank you so much for your patience. What do you have for us today? Well, two things. And I'll try and make them as briefly as I quickly or possibly can here. Yeah. Well, nervous. I've never been on the radio. No, you're fine. You're doing good. First of all, I am a relatively new atheist. Uh, it's been a couple of years now since I've told anyone in my circle of friends and family about my deconversion. But I've actually created kind of a barrier. I've, I have two Twitter accounts and two Google accounts, and I have a whole group of people that I block from most of my information that I update on Facebook um, to kind of protect them from most of my opinions because I know that it would alienate, not only alienate a lot of people, but I would lose a lot of friends and probably family. 
my mother specifically would immediately disown me if she caught wind of this, I'm fairly sure. That's got to be really, really difficult for you. Don't you just want to blurt it out, just get it over with? Do you feel like it's all pent up inside you when you're around her and other religious members of your family? Yes, absolutely. And that's actually the point that I'm getting to here in my own life. Um, I was reading Dan Barker's book, Godless, this afternoon when the tweet came up on my phone that this podcast was happening. And I saw what the topic was, and I immediately jumped up and moved over to my computer to listen. And uh, he wrote a letter to all of his uh, family and friends when he deconverted, and he sent it to all the pastors and family members of these people, some like 50 people, and basically outlined why he had made the decision and what he had done. And I think I'm going to go ahead and do that myself. I'm going to write one of those Facebook notes and just send it to everybody and uh, see what the fallout is, because it's kind of stressful to try and maintain a double life in this way. And I'm really not reaching the people with the information that I want. I'll definitely lose some people in the process, but I think that my goal of, you know, shouting the truth from the mountaintop, for lack of a better term, is would be accomplished if I had their ear. I really like the idea of the letter. I did it myself after reading the very same book. And, and it accomplished a few things for me. One is that when you're speaking and you say the words, I don't believe in God, or you say the word atheist, which is a huge hot button, they, most of the time that I have seen a family member or friend hear it, they, they are no longer listening, right? They are sending, they're not receiving anymore. They've shut down. Now they're in rescue mode. And what I found is by putting it in letter form, it made it so that they are still receiving. They're still going down. Now they might be putting the emotional walls up, the mental walls up, looking through their God glasses, but they're, they're still digesting information. They're not thinking up the next response, verbal response. The second thing I liked about the letter is that it gives you a chance to really measure your words in advance, to make sure you, you've said it the way you want it said, and to go get, make sure that you have the information that you want to present worded the way you want to present it. And you can just take your time. Some people take, you know, months to put the letter together to make sure that it's right before they send it out. And uh, I, I really respect that particular approach. If you're going to come out, make it official and put it on paper. I think it solves a lot of problems. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. And I actually was kind of struggling with a way to do it. And when I read that specific part of his book there and saw that, it kind of dawned on me that kind of an aha moment. This is probably the best way to do it. And I think you're absolutely right. I think it is a good way to not have the conversation shut down. And even if they do put the letter down immediately after reading the A word, uh, they will probably pick it up at some point uh, and read the rest of it or maybe reread it in the future. I don't know. Hopefully somehow it'll get through. That's good stuff. Thank you so much for the call and for your patience on hold and happy new year. Hey, same to you. Thanks, Seth. This is a great exercise. Even if you are not ready to come out to your family, friends, whoever, you're not ready to let the cat out of the bag, write the letter anyway. Write the letter anyway. Trust me. It's a release, right? No one's listening yet, but fire up the computer or whatever and write the letter. Get it out. Put it on paper. Rewrite it, reorganize it, reword it, look at it the next day, go change it, add something, subtract something, make it a project, make it like a diary, make it something that is cathartic for you. Get it out, put it on paper. Trust me, it helps. It also is very important, as much as you can, you must, if you're going to come out, you are going to be challenged on just about every aspect of the religion that you are rejecting. And I agree with Matt Dillahunty on this, is that the more you debate, the better you become at it, usually. And after almost three years with the thinking atheist, I hear most of the arguments that I hear, I've heard many, many, many times before, and I have the responses ready because you see patterns, right? I mean, you can only hear this stuff so long and, and you're going to hear it. How can you be moral without, without the Bible, without, without the Ten Commandments? Adolf Hitler was an atheist. Do you want to be like Hitler? What about the fossil record? The God of the gaps. If, if God didn't create the universe, who did? Which is an inaccurate question to ask anyway. Who being extremely presumptuous. 
I had a personal experience. You can't tell me that I didn't have a near-death experience or this miracle happened or so-and-so was dead for five minutes in the hospital and went to heaven and saw the white light. I mean, you're going to hear this stuff. You, as much as you can, need to be ready. And that means education. That means you are learning what the arguments are and what the counters to them are. And a Google search will go a long, long way. And there are great, I've got links on my website at thethinkingatheist.com. Go to the resources tab and you'll see the Skeptics Annotated Bible and you'll see a bunch of other um, links. And, and you can just Google search top creationist arguments, top religious arguments, top theist arguments and rebuttals. You can get a talk origins. They've got some great resources there. But this is the moment when I think be a sponge, soak it up. Be ready. They won't be changed. Your mind, their mind will not be changed by whatever you respond with. But what I'm saying is with a measured tongue, without a raised voice, if you can help it, when they come at you with, how can you be moral without God? If you were able to provide examples that morality exists in nature, and actually the Ten Commandments are not really about morality to begin with, and the Bible is rife with immorality and atrocity and bloodthirstiness and monstrous acts, and here are specific examples. The God of the Old Testament and the New Testament should not be emulated or followed, and here's why. Because he endorses incest and rape and the killing of infants and you know, the stoning for having sex before having married, you know, assassination for picking up sticks on the Sabbath because it's filled with all these outrageous things that no one can believe in. Stuff that would be outrageous if you read it in a Harry Potter book, you'd never buy it. But then the Bible people believe it. I mean, this is a time where we have to buttress our own arguments, get educated. And that comes with conversations, debating, get online, practice debate with some other people. Make it an exercise and just be ready. Education has been the problem to begin with, right? The, the lack of education was huge for me. Remember that soundbite from Christopher Hitchens? I included it in my tribute video when he was talking to Sean Hannity on Fox News. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said this priceless line, priceless line, and it totally summed up exactly what the problem is. He looked at Sean and he said, forgive me for saying this, but you give the impression of someone who has never read any of the arguments against your position ever. Yes, exactly. It's a culture of people who have read their holy books and know nothing about the writings of evolutionary biologists or cosmologists. They know nothing about the fossil record. They know nothing about the, the human genome. They know nothing about even their own history. Education. Education. Going through my own journey rejecting the faith, I remember I wrote a bunch of notes, made a bunch of lists, and I had a paper trail. You should have seen my office. It was crazy. It looked like a bomb. A paper bomb went off. Highlight stuff. I, oh, it was like an OCD thing. I had stuff stapled everywhere. I had stuff on the walls. I had, I had notes. I had books. It was crazy. And I kept all the information and eventually organized it and was able to incorporate it into the Thinking Atheist website, hopefully to make it easier for other people. And then write the letter. Put it on paper. Trust me, it's going to feel really, really good. Area code 678. You are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Dante. Dante, thank you for calling. What's up? Well, I find that um, myself personally, I started having questions around 12. And my mother, uh, I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal Church. And she took me to the minister because my mother, born in 1934, didn't know anything but religion. And she took me to the minister, and the minister told me, it is the way it is because God made it that way, and don't you ever question it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just turn that curiosity switch right off at the beginning, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And sadly, it had the tinge of, you know, wisdom of eyes, don't look behind this curtain. Yeah. And so, actually, I spent my formative years, 13, 14, 15, reading every piece of religious text I could get my hands on. And I compared it to historical record and, and you know, what was 
verifiable in history and saw how all these books were written in parable and how they may have had some historical value, but absolutely no spiritual value, and they were ridiculous. And I spent my teenage years as a closeted atheist. I joined the Navy at 20 years old. I had gotten married, and I was, I told no one. And then I was about 26. I came home. My wife had become insanely religious. I absolutely had to separate myself from that. And then I finally, one day at Thanksgiving, <laughs> there were just everyone, religion, religion, religion. And I was like, enough, I'm an atheist, leave me alone. And since then, I've been greatly ostracized. Fortunately, I have five friends in the world with all different viewpoints, different religions, but all of them have accepted me for who I am, which they would have been my support system. And it actually is it's hilarious to see the impiety of the pious when it comes to someone not sharing their beliefs, how they, you know, turn on you, how they threaten sometimes. To me, it's like, really? That that's Christian charity? That's how Christians react to someone with a differing viewpoint? Great. Well, that means I'm on the right track then. Curiosity was a good thing, though, for you, right? When you finally flipped that switch back on, it, it, it was liberating, wasn't it? Very. And um, actually, later on, I discovered a quote from a philosopher who said that the swiftest path to atheism is a thorough reading and understanding. Bible, and that's precisely what happened with me. I'm so glad you found your way out. You clawed your way out to the light, man. And I'm I'm glad you called the show. I'm glad you made it through it. Pentecostal Church has some pretty jacked up stuff. That must have been a tough road out to, to get out of that. Especially just, I mean, it's just steeped in this arbitrary, horrible tradition. And a lot of emotion, a lot of tears. You're going to burn forever unless you embrace this loving God. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dante, thank you so much for the call. Thanks for your service, by the way, in, in, the, in the Navy. How many years did you serve? Uh, five years active duty and another three Army National Guard. Awesome. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and Happy New Year. Thanks. Happy New Year to you, too. Now, very quickly, there's uh, an article on weareatheism.com, and we'll probably talk more about this website, I think, in the coming weeks and months. The article is called 10.5 Tips when coming out to family or friends as an atheist. Now, I don't have time or the inclination to read it all. You can just go to the website and find it at weareatheism.com. But some tips that they listed include understand Christian apologetics and how to respond to them. We just spoke about that a second ago, right? You got to have ammunition before you go to battle. Um, they say, don't be too confrontational. Remember where they're coming from and help them to understand where you're coming from. From trying to win the debate won't convert them. I agree. But right now, when you come out, you are just presenting your opinion. And you're going to want to resist the desire to get into a debate, which is what they're, they're, they're in rescue mode. So you're going to have to say, look, just listen, please hear me out. The article says to actively listen. Don't just sit there and nod your head. Make eye contact. Repeat the questions. Make sure that understanding has occurred. Don't use personal examples. I'm not sure what they mean here, so let me read this paragraph outright. It says, make sure to stick to discussing your atheism. Do not bring up past experiences in the family or that someone was a bad parent. Nor should they use sexual trauma, drug addiction, or abuse as your excuse for being an atheist that you are just mad at God. Remember to be rational and show them that you have reasoned your way to atheism. So I think what it's saying is don't use personal examples of how you came to apostasy. Uh, go ahead and use those, but don't don't air the dirty laundry of everything the family has been through situationally as an excuse. Um, be prepared to walk away. Uh, come back when cooler heads prevail. The article says, give it time. As much as it may hurt, some people in your life may need a little more time to process the information. Uh, it's been years on my end, and it's still going on. We'll see what happens. Agree on parameters of the conversation. Good luck with that one, by the way. The article says, talking over food is easier. Sometimes it's easier to have the conversation over a meal. Now, this may mean you're trapped, right? If you're, if you're sitting over dinner, it's not like you can go by. I mean, I guess you can, but it just looks worse. But, uh, you know, relax over a glass of wine. Relax. Talk about it. 
Be a proud atheist, the article says. Don't act ashamed. Make sure your body language is open. Don't cross your arms or legs. Maintain eye contact. Keep your chin or head up. Shoulders back. Posture maintained. Speak with a clear and level tone. I totally agree. You can tell a lot about what people do and do not think or believe by how they conduct themselves without speaking. You know, are the shoulders squared? Do they look confident? Are they measured in their words or are they fumbling? Are they mumbling? Do they look at their shoes? Is their handshake weak? If you need to practice, practice in your car, <laughs> in, your, in your bathroom, wherever. But make sure that you are outwardly comfortable in your own skin. It's very important, I think, because when you're speaking to people, it's like any presentation. You are making a presentation. You're essentially presenting a position. And if you can't assimilate and deliver the information effectively, practice until you can. If you don't have confidence with the material, learn and educate yourself and rehearse and just figure it out until you are. It's going to be hard any way you slice it, but trust me, it's worth it. It may take years. It did me. But there's, there's a way. Your path to speaking out in your culture... I don't know where it will take you or how long it will take you. I do know that we all do eventually, as soon as we can, need to speak out and say something. If we don't say something, who will? Religion is everywhere. The city council meeting I was at the other night, right there on the wall in the middle of the city council hall, it says, in God we trust. Oh, it's part of our political history. It's part of our... It's part of our culture. No. Imagine if I'd been in that room and everybody who didn't believe had spoken out and the culture had truly changed. We might have been able to, you know, I, I make a motion. <laughs> well, I would like that sign removed. <laughs> uh, for those who believe that, that uh, the people who are, who are slower who are still in the closet, who are still figuring it out, who are afraid, or just playing a chess game instead of checkers. For those who believe they are cowards, please reconsider. Trust me, I've been there. And when anyone uh, thinks that, that I was a fake or a fraud, I hope not. I'm a very flawed, imperfect admin, video producer, host, whatever, but I'll tell you, I'm real. I'm a, I, I am an absolute, I'm absolutely convinced that the evidence shows that religion should be completely wiped off the face of the earth, and I'm fighting that fight. But it took me years to get there. Don't invalidate somebody else's path simply because it does not line up with yours, okay? And if you are someone who is living in fear, fear for your job, fear for your livelihood, you're worried about a spouse divorcing you. You're worried about your children not calling you or seeing you or communicating with you or even loving you. You worry about your circle, your neighbors, your community, your influence, your reputation. I totally understand. Please understand you are not alone. You are not alone. Many, many, many other people have gone through the very, very, very same thing. I hope that you can draw from the Facebook page and the website and the websites and pages of so many others to gain encouragement, courage, the tools you need so that the day will come when you stand up and say it out loud. I do not believe in any gods and my life has value. And until that day comes, all my best to you and to yours. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next Tuesday night. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.